then. Yes, let's start and not waste our time. So welcome everyone, um, especially our new Validate members. Uh, Blakely will post the joint link in the chat and you can find um, details. Um, Blakely has a bit trouble with his uh, um, connection, so maybe better to use chat if you want to ask him something directly or maybe in time his um, network will improve. I don't know, but um, he's there. Don't worry. Um, please, everyone, have in mind that this will be recorded as you have just uh, heard the, the voice and the whole session. So um, let be, Blakely know if you don't want to appear in, in the final edit. If you have any trouble, just let him know. Um, we will do first uh, one presentation, then another presentation, then we will have a joint Q, uh, questions and answers. Um, we would prefer people, people to speak up. So just put a hand up and then you will uh, put on your mic and ask a question or discuss or comment or something. Um, but if you're shy and you don't want to speak, um, you're welcome to type the question in the chat. And please do keep in mind to uh, keep your mic closed during the presentation time. And please do speak up during the discussion time. We, we are encouraging you to, to speak up. Now, um, Validate Network had a beautiful One Health workshop in September. We were in uh, Parl in, in South Africa, and this is where I have met these two exceptional presenters that you will listen to today, and I heard about their fantastic work. Um, we had there uh, two full days of presentations from uh, around the world, and it was a very inspiring time. Um, besides doing so much science, we, we did a lot of friendship time. So that was very nice. Um, and it was quite an experience for me personally, because you, you don't have um, many chances to, to meet people from the other side of the world uh, in person. So webinars like this are blessed because you can hear a lot of stuff from all around the world, like you have the chance today. And I don't want to make this introduction too long and take much of their time, but um, welcome to the Validate One Health Seminar number two that is named Health Systems and Infrastructure Challenges in One Health. Um, and I would like to straight go forward to the introduction of our first speaker. His name is Dr. Juan Deep. He is a research professor at the Universidad del Norte, Colombia, which maybe means North University of Colombia. He will correct me if I'm wrong. For more than 20 years, Dr. Juan has been dedicated to the integral study of tropical diseases, parasitology, and infectious diseases in rural, rural and remote areas of Colombia with indigenous populations. He has experience in fieldwork and communities during surveillance of infectious diseases. He has expertise in determining transmission dynamics of infectious diseases by molecular epidemiological studies and in rural remote areas. We keep on um, emphasizing the indigenous population and rural areas um, because um, that is completely different than what like we do in Europe. <laughs> you will see in this um, fascinating presentation that is named Solutions Against Infectious Diseases in Indigenous Populations, Intracultural Challenges in One Health. Um, the, the, the challenges has uh, to go up against, uh, that he has to go up against when working with indigenous populations are way different than we have to, for example, in Europe. So he will highlight the fundamental differences in understanding of health and diseases between indigenous uh, so, uh, um, populations and Western medicine approach. So that is very interesting. And Dr. Juan, the floor is yours if you are ready. Okay. Let's see. Let's let me know. You can see the slides. Yes, we can see the slides. Try changing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. They change. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. It's fine. Okay, okay. First, I want to. Uh, yes, I would like to thank uh, the Validate Network to invite me to share with all of you in this seminar. That is, uh, especially when you are going to talk about what you'd like to do. It's wonderful. It's, I I'm always thanks this opportunity. And also to thank all of you. I mean, good morning, good afternoon, because I know that you are connected from different places of the world. 
So I will start talking about these solutions against infectious diseases, about the experience that we have had in the last 20 years, and how to face intercultural challenge for one health. There's a, a, a little introduction about the world view of health and disease, comparing Western medicine with the aboriginal and traditional point of view. Then some experience and examples with cultural epidemiology and infectious diseases. And then we are going to move forward trying to talk about intercultural challenge to apply one health uh, for the control of tropical diseases and infectious diseases in this population. So, so this is in, in Barranquilla, the, the Universidad del Norte, the North University. That's where my office is. And we have a group that is working in tropical medicine, medical anthropology, cultural epidemiology, immunology, and integrated genetics of infectious diseases. Um, and actually, we are working, you know, in this in, in the map, in the north part of Colombia, that's uh, the Sierra Nevada uh, of Santa Marta, the highest mountain in the world closer to the sea, where four different indigenous groups are living there with different languages. And even uh, they have a lot of infectious diseases. We always wonder why some indigenous people are exposed to infection and they don't get infected and why some infected people, they never get sick. So we did a lot of basic science doing research about genetics of the pathogen, reservoirs, humans, epigen epigenetics, maracobiomes. And now in the recent years, we start to, to do in also social science because we know that a lot of things are missing and we cannot handle and make solutions for the problem just with basic science. So we need to make integration between the basic science and social science. So talking about the worldview of health and disease, for Western medicine is like we have a kind of reductionist approach. Usually we understand the disease, uh, that I mean like the only problem or the health as the absence of disease. But for Aboriginal people, uh, for them, the meaning of health is balance, is harmony. So they have a more holistic and, and an ecosystemic point of view. For example, for Western medicine, environmental, we, we only care about environment if it's affecting us. But for indigenous people, environmental is an integral part of life. For Western medicine, nature is at the service of men and man lives from nature. But for the aboriginous people, Men is part of nature and men lives with nature. That makes a big difference how they really, uh, I mean, believe and, and behave in harmony with nature. This indigenous population have a lot of knowledge about animals and animals have a different meanings. It's not only a productive relationship for food or for work. They have also cultural connotations and spiritual representations. In this slide, you will see some ceramics and gold that I have found and in relation with some animals that they use like for secret rituals and spiritual representations for the harmony in the community. So this is very new for us to understand uh, and in order to work sometimes with zoonotic diseases that we cannot make control and decisions about how to take care of the wild animals or domestic animals without paying attention to these spiritual connotations. But it's true also that with the intercultural changes in the, I mean, in the last maybe century, the consumption of animal uh, protein food uh, changed from hunting to domestication of animals. But when we talk about domestication of animals in the wild, I mean, in, in wild environments, that means that we face a very unique human-animal interface that is giving us a big risk to contact with pathogens. And, and for that reason, we increase the possibilities of infectious diseases in this population that is taking care of domestic animals, but with some uh, very different conditions that we used to do in the Western medicine or, or the Occidental lifestyle. Like animals, indigenous people also, they have a lot of knowledge about plants and they are incorporated in the, the daily life. And it's not only uh, for food, as we do in agriculture, but it's also for medicine, for healing diseases, and not only to heal diseases of humans. They have a lot of knowledge about the plants that they use 
to heal diseases in animals and also the ones that they use for uh, like pest control for agriculture. So we did a botanical expedition from the sea level to the top of the mountain trying to classify all these plants. And we have been improving a lot of knowledge for our occidental medicine, trying to find new ways, new alternative treatments for tropical diseases. So, okay, for example, in the use of endobotany for the treatment of infectious disease, we found some endemic plants that are unique in these mountains. And they use, for example, for cutaneous lace maniosis, and we saw that it was effective in the way they use it. So we were starting doing research and taking care of the molecules and, and, and working in the lab with those plants in vitro with the parasites. And we really proved that it's a very interesting alternative for the treatment of Leishmania. In the same way, we found another plant that they are using and they were teaching us how to use it for pest control, especially this one that you see here in yellow, that they use it to take care of, of the kissing bugs. So it's like they, they use this fruit and they put it to burn in the cook fire in the, inside the house. And with the smoke, I mean, they go outside of the house and with the smoke, it's like the, all the insects will die and fell down. So then they go inside again and they just take out of the, the insects and the bugs. So this is a very interesting, I mean, method of vector self-control culturally uh, accepted that is sustainable. And, and it can be complemented with the residual insecticides that sometimes is not sustainable because it's very expensive and it's very different when you go to the village, all houses are together, maybe you can spray with some kind of residual insecticides. But when you go to the farms, it's like one farm is far away from each other. One farm can be like seven hours walking, the other one three hours walking, the other one again like four hours walking. So in order to go, I mean, farm by farm, just one trained person to do the residual insecticide spraying, it will take forever. And maybe if they do it once, they will not do it again. So we needed to do innovation and create new, new methods that can be sustainable and culturally accepted for this indigenous population. Actually, it was not our innovation. We just learned from them that they, they realized the method that they use, and we just were trying to test if it works. So, but the prevalence of infectious diseases and zoonosis in indigenous communities is much higher than in the general populations in different countries. This is true. And we cannot apply the same interventions that we have done in Western medicine and, or in the cities, because for example, they don't write and they don't read. So sometimes we are trying to create some materials, materials for health and promotion, we are trying to create some strategies, but they, they they don't work. We need to start listening and trying to involve them. They, they, they need to be involved and they need to be the ones that can create the solution and the strategies to take care of all these diseases. We already know that they have a lot of wisdom about nature and a lot of knowledge about wild animals. However, there is a big gap uh, because they don't know about my, microbiology. So if they don't know about microbiology, it's difficult uh, to, to know how is the dynamics of transmission of these zoonotic infections. So that's a, a big gap in order to work one health because even if they have the knowledge about nature and balance and the ecological point of view, if they don't know exactly about virus, bacteria, parasites, and how on the life cycles of those between animals and vectors, so it's very difficult that they can design a, a strategy for control without having this very clear. And on the other hand, even animals are so important for them, they don't have like a, a very cultural, a deep, deep cultural strategies for animal healthcare. So if you see in this slice, in this picture, this is a regular Indian house and they have like an average of five to 10 people, an average of 10 to 20 animals, in the house, this is the kind of animals, some wild animals that are domesticated and some domestic animals that search and, and have contact with different species and they are in very bad shape. These animals are in very bad shape um, and they need really to have some improvement in healthcare for animals. They are not used to doing it. If the animals dies, they just replace it for others. So this is also here like a challenge that we have. 
When we go to the cities and some farms as uh, the Western style, we will find a lot of technical support for animal production. And usually men and adults are the ones that are taking care of the animals. But in indigenous villages and indigenous population, especially with the people that we are working in Sierra Nevada, I mean, women and children are the ones that are taking care of animals. They are the most exposed to animals in this unique animal-human interface. So that makes a big difference in order to transmission who's gonna get sick first and how diseases can be transmitted between the family inside the household. No, I cannot. Okay. Okay. So, so usually we already know about the the point of view that the indigenous have that it's like they have more knowledge about balance, harmony, nature. That is the concept of one head. But however, I think that we are usually trying to teach them so they can understand what we want, what we want to do, and we are preparing indigenous people to work with us. But usually this methodological approach drawn from Western scientific methods. So I think that it's not good to do it that way because I think that we need to listen more to them and start learning from them. So they need to not only participate, but they need to, to be the leaders of the ideas and the methods and the strategies that we can incorporate to, according to the priorities in the community, according to the values and beliefs, so it can be sustainable, everyone can work on that. Uh, we need to involve the indigenous people also in the research. They need to be authors and also the PIs of the projects, uh, because if we are talking about some topics that they are the ones that have more knowledge and wisdom, even if they don't have a degree, Usually we think that science is just for PhD people, but, but they have a lot of knowledge through a lot of experience that they can be PIs of different projects in their knowledge. Uh, One Health is highly appropriate according to their beliefs and customs, according to how they approach in a holistic way all uh, health and nature. But we need to pay attention on that. I want to, to share this example the just last month, we did a comprehensive intercultural course, course for integrated care of Chagas disease. So it was like a, a confluence of traditional and Western medicine. So that was supported by the NDI, Tropical Health Foundation, the indigenous organization, the institutions that provide health service for the indigenous people, the National Institute of Health in Colombia, the Minister of Health in Colombia, and the local authorities. So we start with a training course when the indigenous people were training at the health authorities, the, the medical doctor, the, the NIH people, the, all the workers from different institutions were training first, but the indigenous traditional healers uh, and the more uh, wisdom people in the communities. And I think that's the first step to start learning from them in a, in a state of trying to teach them. If we start learning from them, we figure out new approach and, and the way that we can really do innovation to reduce the problems and they can be the leaders and also the programs can be more sustainable. This is another example that is very interesting. If you read this title, like tuberculosis reduction through conservation of Crax alberti, maybe you will think, oh, that sounds crazy. I mean, Crax alberti is a wild turkey uh, this wild turkey is maybe in the top of, of the dangerous species of, of bird for conservation. So usually they used to hunt this wild turkey to, to eat it. So they say, well, children, uh, they are malnourished sometimes. Uh, they don't have food, so they get sick. They don't have a good immune responses. They get tuberculosis. So if you want us to stop hunting that turkey, we need to replace that food. So you can teach us how to culture fish. We can eat a lot of fish. So children can be in better shape, a better immune response and reduce tuberculosis. So it's very logical and it makes common sense after I explain that. 
But in the beginning, it sounds crazy. So these kind of ideas come from them in the way they see uh, how to approach to solutions uh, and the problem that they have. So this project was very successful in the indigenous villages in order to improve the, the nutrition of the children and the immune responses against infectious diseases. And also the purpose of the sponsors was to preserve this wild turkey and now they are not hunting the wild turkey anymore. So there is a challenge to establish infectious diseases surveillance programs in remote rural populations with these special features. Uh, I mean, they are apart from each other. There are more than 150 villages far apart from each other. There is no communication, no electricity. So a lot of challenges that come from this. In rural and remote communities, there might be fewer healthcare options I mean, the, the distance is far away. We walk by walking sometimes one day, two days, three days by walking or by mule. So when the, we have outbreaks, uh, we have been used in the helicopter. It's not very easy to get the helicopter to go there. And usually it's because the authorities in the government are trying to help to, to do some kind of attention to reduce the mortality in this kind of outbreaks, uh, especially for immune preventable diseases. That because they are naive vaccinated when some new pathogen arrives and they don't have antibodies. So it's very dangerous for them. But there is a challenge to, to break this geographic distance. So we need to continue and extend the ongoing surveillance efforts to better identify this disease burden among indigenous people. And local and also on regional levels, this is very important to increase public health actions. The involvement and leadership of the indigenous people, as I was saying before, not only in actions, but also in the research, is so important to the effectiveness and sustainability of the outcomes. So we know there is a lot of aboriginal people around the world in the different continents, in different settings. And there is a, a need to high strength of evidence research to be undertaken in these communities internationally. Yeah. So we can further understand how one health approach may be applied in these settings. It's not like we are gonna generalize uh, how to do one health for indigenous people. It can be something that can be generalized or learning from different experience, but we need to know that there is always local epidemiology, unique cultural uh, issues and new knowledge in everywhere that we need to implement according to that unique places, the way to do it. But we need to take advantage or how they see nature, how they see balance between environment, humans, how they live, I mean, as part of nature, that this comes from the beginning, from the knowledge that they have. For us, for our culture, our Western medicine is something that we have been just uh, talking about maybe 20, 30 years that we say, oh, one health, oh, everybody's talking about one health. But when we really talk to them, that's what they have been doing for centuries. So maybe the intercultural approach must be something that we learn from each other and we can do implementations together to reduce these kind of problems that are affecting the quality of life, not only for indigenous people around the world, but also for all the population. So I just want to say thanks to the team that we have in the Tropical Health Foundation that is very interdisciplinary team. We have I mean, veterinarians, we have microbiologists, nurses, medical doctors, we have botanics. So that's the way that we need to face these problems in an integrated form. So I will be pending for the questions at the end. So I'm gonna quit the presentation. Hope you can see the slides and, and be just pending on the questions at the end of the seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. This was really fascinating. Um, thank you for sharing all your work. For me, it is all, always very interesting because I have no knowledge of in, indigenous populations. And, and for me, it's very interesting. And I hope also for the audience. Um, guys, you can you can type your questions um, already now in the chat and we will read them at the end so that you don't forget. So feel free to, to type in the chat and, and we will answer them at the end. Um, and now we go for our second part. The Validate Network is taking us from Colombia to Madagascar. Um, 
we have there our second speaker for today, and it's Dr. Nina Rakotsaman. So <laughs> I hope that was right. <laughs> So um, he's the head of the microbacteriology unit at the Pasteur Institute of Madagascar. Now I have to be honest with you. When I think of Madagascar, I think of the happy smiling animals and nice places from the movie. But unfortunately, um, this country has to fight the same battles against diseases as the rest of the world. But fortunately, they have fantastic Dr. Nina on their side. Um, he has been working on tuberculosis at the Institute Pasteur de Madagascar since 2010. He is currently leading a translational and operational research program that is aimed to develop new tuberculosis diagnostic tools and also focuses on drug resistance surveillance in collaboration with the National Tuberculosis Control Program of Madagascar. Dr. Nina's presentation is called Impact and Solutions. Okay, you can already see it on the screen. Um, and he will address strategies to improve tuberculosis care and obtain epidemiological information in remote areas of Madagascar, including the use of new technologies. But I don't want to reveal anymore because this is really so creative, creative and it is interesting for you to see when he presents it. So the floor is yours. Dr. Nina, go for it. Thank you so much, Sarah, for this kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking also the organizers for having me here and to share this uh, talk from and uh, data and work from Madagascar. I, I wanted to say that I don't see the screen at all. Maybe it's from my side. Do you see the screen from your side? We see it and it's fine. Just try uh, who's changing the... The slides. The black is changing. So, okay. So, um, but if me, you can't see it, that might be a problem. Um, okay. Anyway, I, I, I can make it. So, in the first screen is the title screen. Uh, it's my name and my institution. So, I'm working mainly on tuberculosis. But at the Institute Pasteur de Madagascar, we are also working on the infectious diseases. Uh, like 20 different infectious diseases. Next slide, please. So I, I first wanted to have some words on Madagascar. Uh, so Madagascar is this big island uh, close to the African continent and we are a uh, member of the African continent. And this country is well known for its tourism because of this fauna and flora that is very endemic uh, and that is not found elsewhere in the world. And Madagascar have also some destinations that are amongst the top 10 destination for tourism. Uh, this country is very rich based on the mining resources. We have gold, jeans, and different mine resources that are exploited uh, Differently, sometimes it's well organized, sometimes it's badly organized. And Madagascar is also producing a lot of uh, crops like rice and also exotic sp uh, spices. Despite this, uh, this different rich aspect of the country, the population of Madagascar is very poor. So Madagas the, pop the Malagasy population is amongst the poorest in the world based on different data from the World Bank and from the different institutions. Next slide, please. So with this poverty of the population, we do have a lot of tuberculosis. So the incident rate, uh, rate of tuberculosis is very high. It's, it's pretty high. Um, we, in Madagascar, about 35,000 TB cases per year are notified by the National Tuberculosis Program and the incidence is about 233 per 100,000 inhabitants. Madagascar population has very low uh, TB HIV co-infection, about 1.3% of the TB have HIV and high BCG vaccine coverage that is mainly given to the newborns about uh, 92 to 98 percent of the newborns are vaccinated to 
with the, with the BCG. Based on the latest data on TB in Madagascar, it was uh, to be noticed that when seeing the incidence and the notified cases, it is estimated that about 50% of the patients in this country are missed. Next slide, please. So normally in this slide, we have the total TB care in Madagascar. I, no, sorry. The, the, Madagascar, the Madagascar context, just to tell you why we do have this lot of cases, the TB patients that were not uh, identified or detected. Because of the population extreme heterogeneity, it, it we have sociodemographic, environmental, cultural, economic, and edu educational heterogeneity. So I just wanted to, to introduce the Madagascar context uh, that is causing this, uh, the fact that tuberculosis patients are lost and are not detected. Uh, we do have this population extreme heterogeneity. And uh, depending on the location you are in the island, you have different situation, different uh, population density and different health system infrastructures, uh, if any. And but the, the common thing is that all this population lived in very uh, precarity and uh, uh, in uh, in poverty, and most of them are living in tight knit communities and crowded housing. Next slide, please. So how do we deal with the TB care in Madagascar? Knowing that most of the population live in remote rural setting, we have to, to invent uh, and to have alternative solutions because it's really difficult to reach out those population that, that are living in remote settings, knowing that about 70% of them are living in rural areas and about 40% of the Madagascar population are living in those remote settings. And by remote setting, I mean people that are not reachable from the road because of obsolete lens transport and most of the health infrastructures, infrastructures are days of working distance from any, from those villages in remote areas. So in those pictures, you can see how we do reach the population, for instance, to get the national drug surveillance, drug resistance survey. Uh, this year, we had to cross rivers. We had to, to have the help of the army because in some areas, there is some uh, security and safety concern. You can go there without the help of the, the army because you, you may be attacked. So. Those are the challenges we, we are facing. Next slide, please. And if there are uh, TB healthcare infra infrastructures, we also have uh, these ge geographical inequities I discussed uh, before, because in urban area, you, you can have well-equipped infrastructures with the gene expert, with sequencers, etc. But in most of the peripheral healthcare structures in rural settings, especially, you do have uh, under resourced uh, health centers uh, with understaffed uh, personal. Next slide, please. So, what are the consequences of that? Uh, this year and in 2017, we published this uh, study based on the cascade of care to follow up the, the, the care of these TB patients in Madagascar. And we found out that based on the epidemiological data we have from those different regions and from the, the National Tuberculosis Program, uh, it sounds that uh, the, the surveillance is underperforming. So if you look at this uh, slide, you can see that from 100 
potential to be patient, only 83 can reach the diagnostic and treatment center, and about 57 are effectively diagnosed with tuberculosis. But once they are diagnosed with TB, they can be treated and most of them achieve their treatment. But what we found out that we do lose a lot of patients between the, their location and the, to, the, uh, to their diagnostics. Next slide, please. So the other concern we do have in Madagascar is also the close proximity between uh, the population and their, uh, their uh, pets or the animals. And this came the question of uh, one health risks because of this interdependent uh, relationship uh, and uh, links between animals and humans and this close proximity between cattle and uh, the human and uh, also the close proximity between the humans and the wild animals like those labels you can see. And because uh, also of the fact that the, the population there also eat meat and beef from the cattle and from the, the wild animals. So there is a, an increasing risk of zoonotic transmission of tuberculosis that would uh, uh, perpetrate the, the reservoir of tuberculosis in the country. Next slide, please. So then came the alternatives we are uh, proposing to try to reach out first those populations that are in, re in remote settings. So we propose to set and use new technologies to try to understand TB and to get to reach those population in remote settings. So here we have the example of a study we led in the southern of the country where there's a lot of person living in remote areas, as I explained to you. So the idea here was to educate the community about tuberculosis symptoms by using the smartphone and using the small videos with the symptoms of TB. So the, 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 the villagers and or the chief of the village can, can identify some TB-like symptoms just from the videos. And once they identify TB symptoms, we do send drones to the villages to let them get the student from the uh, from the the TB suspected person. So we do send drones to to the village once someone has those TB symptoms. The villagers and the community persons take the samples and bring the samples into the drones. And then the drones came back to the, to the health center for TB diagnostics. So we do, uh, in, the, in this area, we did perform gene expert. And once the gene expert was positive, we sent back the drones to the villages uh, with treatment. And we put the treatment within the, the, the MERM device in the middle of the, of, of the slide. Uh, that is an, an electronic device that beep every day. And when you open it up, you take your pill and you, you close the, the device and it will beep then the next morning. So it's a kind of dots, but a remote dot, a dot uh, using uh, an electronic device. Next slide, please. So from this study in the southern of Madagascar, we, we found out that using those kind of educational videos can make the, the difference when the villagers understand and can identify TB in the community, even if they are not aware and about the disease or if they, are, they have low literacy, they can find out uh, those TB uh, uh, suspected persons. And um, with these studies, unfortunately, we do have a lot of troubles 
uh, to fly the drones within the, the area, but we generate recommendations for govs, for implementers, and for drone providers on how to improve those kind of technologies to get access to the population in those remote areas. And we also uh, try to 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 study the cost effectiveness of using those drones to take the to diagnose uh, the the patient. Next slide, please. <coughs> Sorry. So to also try to understand and to study the, the TB in those rural settings. Knowing that in those populations, we, we do have a lot of respiratory disease that is not only linked to tuberculosis, but can also be due to air pollution. Uh, they are using charcoal, uh, they, they are cooking food inside their, 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 their house. So in this project, we put some smartphone with a, a cough counter app uh, in those households, and we try to record every cough in those households. And from the cough, we use an artificial, an artificial intelligence to try to, to, to get the best model to fit, the, to, to detect the, the real TB based on gene expert and microbiology and to, and to try to identify the cough associated to tuberculosis. This is an ongoing project. We, are, we gathered uh, those cough recorded not only in Madagascar, but also in other countries in the world. And we identify one model that can be used to detect those codes associated with tuberculosis. Uh, as you can see here, you can, you can see the, the, the rock curve that is uh, to detect the, the real TB, the confirmed TB from those codes that are associated to, associated to something else. Next slide, please. We also try to because there, there there is because of the need of alternative uh, samples for tuberculosis. We also try to implement this project to uh, study the the blood biomarkers of tuberculosis in those remote populations, knowing that. In those areas, and for these biomarkers, you do need venous blood that is not feasible in those areas because there is no cold chain. You have to travel uh, from days, so if you don't have the cold chain on site, you don't. You can make those. Uh, you, you you can sample the blood, but you can you cannot use the blood, uh, the venous blood. So we try to 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 get and to study those blood biomarkers by, by using uh, dried blood spots. The idea here is to find out the biomarkers in the TB biomarkers in the venous blood and to find them up and to find them in the dried blood spot because what can found in the blood from venous, uh, from the vein, from the veins can be found, should be found in the capillary. So we, what we found out is we did found those biomarkers uh, in venous blood and in capillary blood, but uh, at different uh, proportions. So the studies are going, we're going to publish soon the data. Next slide, please. And we also wanted to ask, we wanted to study the transmission of tuberculosis in those remote areas. We, we had to, to use uh, devices and tools that can be used on the field. So we, we wanted to use the MyNion to, uh, from the samples from the sites to, to understand those TB transmission. <laughs> and first, we, we just compare in this study published last year, we, we wanted to compare whether the, the MyNion sequencer gave the same data as the Illumina, if you can get the same resistant or susceptible drug resist, uh, drug uh, 
uh, if you can get the, the same drug susceptibility or drug resistance prediction from Minayan or from Illumina, and we found out from this study that the, the results of drug re of mutations found from in the Minayan sequencers and in the Illumina are comparable and they are almost the same. So we published this last year. Next slide, please. And then we, we published this study where we wanted to directly sequence samples uh, without culture, because knowing that in those areas, culturing tuberculosis strains is not, is not possible at all. So we, we wanted to, to, to establish some methods to sequence uh, those samples from sputum and then we are now preparing other samples from milk and from meat and from from different uh, animals. And our first study, uh, as you can see here, uh, it's not working very well, to be honest, <laughs> uh, but it, it's still improving. So in the study we published, we published this year, we can find out, for, for instance, the green histograms. We can see the the TB genomes we had to 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 detect and when using direct direct sa samples like sputum here you can find out that we don't have this green uh histo histograms anymore so it means that we we are, we are really we had some difficult to get those tb genomes in the sputum if we don't have the culture but i know that a lot of teams uh, in the world are trying to improve this this uh, this methodology to to directly sequence the samples and I I, I hope that it would get improved uh, maybe soon. Next slide, please. So yeah, so just to finish with this, I uh, if we can uh, if the patient cannot reach out the the health centers, our idea is, is to go to the to those patients and to bring them what we can and what the technology can can uh, can uh, can be the alternative so this will end my presentation can you have the next slide please okay i just wanted to thank the all the partners that participated to these different studies and the founders uh and next slide please and this is the end. I, I return back to the to this Madagascar movie Sarah mentioned before, but there is a lot more to do and to see there. So maybe see you there. See you here soon. Okay, so um, there was one comment that it's a really lovely presentation, Juan. And um, this work clearly requires great cultural sensitivity and interdisciplinary approach. How receptive do you think these indigenous communities are to Western trained scientists coming to do research in um, on their practices? Okay, yes, in our experience, I mean, as far as you are always uh, talking, like, I mean, very clear with the communities, and you go to the process and understanding them and explaining to them, usually they are open mind after you just uh, pass this barrier of, inter of cultural prevention that sometimes they have. Uh, we have now some uh, protocols, NIH project sponsored by uh, NIH in the United States, that is about surveillance of influenza virus. And uh, with one health approach, because we are doing surveillance in households, and we need to look all the animals in households and the dynamics and transmission between uh, birds, and pigs, and chickens, etc., etc. So they really accept, and they are part of the team. So in these projects, we are working uh, methods, microbiologists, medical doctors, nurses, but also indigenous people is involved uh, as a very important part of the protocols. So it could be scientists that they can go there, but also some people with technical approach, as far as they can see also uh, the benefits that they can have uh, from the research. There are some research that sometimes they don't see a very clear benefit, 
but they know that Occidental and Western people can receive benefits of that knowledge. I mean, if they have that clear, they also will accept, they will cooperate, in, in, even that they know that they will not benefit themselves. So we have found a way is building trust and working together. Thank you, Juan. So we have another one for you. Um, do you have veterinarians in your team, considering the close link between the indigenous population and animals? Well, I, I wanted to say something that in Colombia we have a big problem with that. I mean, that, for example, I mean, med vets in Colombia, they get trained to take care of domestic animals just for production. And sometimes small animals like dogs and cats, just yeah, because they are pets. And usually biologists that they know about wildlife, but they don't know how to take care and handle the animal. They know about monitoring and the dynamics. So we really need method training in wildlife, especially in those unique animal human interface that the indigenous people is exposed to wildlife and they are in contact with wildlife and the way that they take care of domestic animals is also in wild environments. So there is a need for uh, med beds working with wildlife. Um, but we have some that are trying to teach us and actually the indigenous people, sometimes they know more than we do about how to catch the animal, how to, uh, I mean, like the sample of the animal, we just, uh, I mean, go with the techniques to see how to improve it, how to use the, the supplies, but they have a lot of experience. Thanks. So if you know any vets, they want to work with wild animals, send them to Colombia and they will uh, be happy. <laughs> uh, they are welcome. Very welcome. Okay. There is also one uh, suggestion for you, considering the variation and unique cultural values of the indigenous people, it is desirable to deliberately encourage their children to pursue a career in medicine, but we can say also in veterinary medicine, right? Sure. Um, and related fields, they are more likely to remain in their communities and receive acceptance from their people. So well, I guess you agree with that, yeah. yeah. But we have some experience that, for example, some indigenous, they went to the cities to study, they learn Spanish, they went to the school, to the university, they got the degree as a medical doctor, but they went, they went back to the village and they could not work the Occidental medicine, because the, uh, I mean, it's not like they are going to have our knowledge uh, to work with them as a part of someone outside the culture. So it's not that easy. That's why I say that it's not only that we can train uh, train the indigenous people in our science, but also maybe we need to train our people in their knowledge. It's in both ways that we need to work. So I think that we need more training of our people in their knowledge at this moment, because we have already uh, some professionals, indigenous people, for example, the one that I show in the slide that was receiving the graduation, he got his master in natural science. And usually when they prepare with our knowledge, they, at the end, will keep working with Western style and, and, and the Western programs so we are not going to have the impact that we will have and we will need to have in, in the indigenous population. Okay. <laughs> so um, I cannot imagine uh, coming a drone to my lab and bringing me a sample. I cannot imagine that. So um, really, congratulations to you and your, and your techniques. But most of the questions are on that end. So the first one is with the drone, how do you ensure the right patient gets the right treatment? Oh. Do you understand what they're asking? So when the drone yes, comes uh, with the treatment, how are you sure that the right person gets it? So when we use this, we, we, we rely on the, because in those villages, there is a chief uh, it can be someone they elected, someone the the, the 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 oldest person in the in the village, and there there are also some uh, community health workers. Do you hear me? Hello. Yeah. 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 Okay. You're fine. You're fine. Yeah. And we 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 rely on those persons uh, to to to. To, to to identify the person that where the, the treatment has to be addressed. 
Okay, so you re you rely on the chief of the village, right? Yes, because yes, they do. are they are the trusty persons that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, how feasible are these technologies implementation, knowing how expensive it is? Yeah. <laughs> this is the question we we got when we when we submit the the project to different founders and to the and to the the ethical committee of Madagascar. So at that time, our answer was. Why do we use hundreds of millions of dollars using drones to kill people and bomb them? And why don't we use drones to try to save lives? You know? And th th this is the, <laughs> the, 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 the PI uh, speech we use at that time. But yeah, like any technologies, uh, if for, for the moment using these drones is quite expensive, we, we agree. But if we can give the arguments that it can be usable, if we can use it uh, on the field, it can be used widely. And once used widely, the, the cost will decrease. Like for any technologies, like the gene expert at the beginning, it was really expensive. And with the use of these technologies, if they are widely used, the costs are decreased. So, we bank on that, and uh, for the moment, this is what we just can say: that once you use it uh, widely, the the price and the cost are going to decrease. Thank you, um, Blakely. Would like to say something. Your hand is up. Is that on purpose? Um, yes, yes, I thought people were going to hear. We've had some trouble. Hey, it's Rowan landed in my hometown in the UK. Um, and the next, it would go offline, it would disappear from you, and the next day you'd be able to find it on eBay um, because it would have been stolen. And I was just wondering, have you had any trouble with the drones being damaged or stolen or, you know, just mysteriously disappearing? Um, what kind of security do you have on them, I guess, is the question. Is that kind of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you so, understand? Uh, Could you understand, Blakely? Could you understand mm -hmm. him? So let me try to, to, to repeat the question to, to make it sure I understand. So the question is, how safe is the use of the, the drones if, if they get stolen or, or something like that, right? Stolen yeah. or damaged. Stolen or damaged. Do, do the drones get stolen or damaged? Or... Yes. So, uh, so far, the drones we used are uh, big enough to, to get stolen. So those are not the drones that you can find out in the in the mall, you know? Those are like the like the Reaper drones, they're big enough so, so they are really difficult to get stolen. But the the concern we the concern we had is that uh, the drones we use are are were able to land and to and to take off uh, vertically. And the, the, the technology was not uh, was not very good uh, when when we performed the study, so we had a lot of troubles to find out uh, plate areas to, for the landing and for the for the takeoff of the drones, and but from the population it was uh, well accepted. We don't had any trouble with the population. We had more trouble with the the. The the aviation uh, the civil aviation authorities that refused to get to give us the the clearance to fly the drones uh, and we had to wait like one year to get uh, clearance for every flight so it was really difficult to get this clearance uh, at that time but we di didn't have any trouble with uh, with the fact that the drones can be stolen or or damaged. So you actually had more trouble with the public uh, organizations, public service, than with the villagers who have never seen the drone At before. that time, yes. This yeah. is where we, we did have the, the, the trouble. Okay. okay. Yep. We have one more question. It's actually from Juan. Um, do you want to, Juan, do you want to say it? Oh, yes, yes, I, I want to. Thank you. 
But I wanted to ask, uh, I mean, if you, all these technologies are used for research projects, I, I can imagine that it will be trying to apply for public health purpose. But how feasible is to extrapolate, I mean, all these technologies that are used in research to do it in a regular base in, for public health purpose in the control of TB in, in special settings? Mm -hmm. Because actually, I just wanted to, to share some experience that we got with drones in the mountains in Colombia. We got mm -hmm. some drones and they crash in the mountains and it was mm -hmm. very expensive. Because usually yeah. they have like labs for drones and they must be appropriate for different places, different areas. So it's like something that is, that is improving, but I just wonder, I mean, dreaming about a public health TV yeah. program using drones. How do you see that? <laughs> yes, when we, when we approach, for instance, our uh, Ministry of Public Health, you know, they are, just to tell you that here, the the main tool to detect TB is microscopy. So just to tell you where we are, you know. And when we came to them with with this idea of drones, they have this smile on their face, and they say, "Okay, those guys are dreaming." And we we, we came with uh, an American university, the Stony Brook, and um, they are like, "Okay, those cowboys are going to do their things. Let's see, it can be funny." You can feel that from their perspective, it's just like something uh, utopic, futuristic, that is not clo very close to the, the to the reality. So, how feasible? Uh, uh, I need. I think we need uh, arguments, and if we make impact by using drones in some areas, uh, I think we, if we, and if we can bring the arguments to the gov or to the stakeholders or those kind of persons, uh, to the policy makers, we, by saying that, okay, using, by using drones, you're going to increase your notification rate by this, by this, this, to make the decision, the decision to use the drones. But without that, it will be like a futuristic thing. Uh, I don't know if I did reply to you, but no, yeah. thank you. Welcome. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? Let me see. You have a lot of uh, um, a lot of thanks and a lot of very nice presentations. Oh, there thank is, you, guys. There is a saludos deste from Mexico to Doctor Dib. So, um. I have one question, if I may go back to Juan. Um, so when when you did the the turkey fish project, Juan, um, and the people started eating fish instead of the turkeys, and they let the turkeys live, did they overproduce? Did you did did humans again disrupt the the you know the system and the the biodiversity? Um, well, well, <laughs> I mean, it's because, I mean, they, they start uh, stop hunting the turkey and then they start learning how to, to culture the fish because it's like artificial way that they put it in some stands and, and they start trying to prepare uh, with some plants from the same territory to prepare the food for the fish in order to be sustainable. So they prepare like a, a big, uh, like a little dump for, for the fish in the village so for families, but they everyone cannot take the fish from there. They will take like a like a plastic bag with the I mean the, the babies of the fish to take it to the farm. And each family will have in each farm uh, to to put the grow the fish. When they finish, they go back to the village to take more fish and to put it to grow in the farm. So it was the only way to make it sustainable. And the the food for the fish was made by vegetables around the village. The, the, a specialized a, a scientist that is expert in that uh, teach them how to prepare that food. So it's still working. And we also at the same time prepare some indigenous like microscopies so they, they could do the diagnosis by uh, microscope to the TB uh, cases and they could prove that it was reducing like in the school and in the village. Thank you. That is so interesting to me. <laughs> okay. 
Um, now you have one, one more question. Do you want to say it, Nina? Yes, thank you, sir. Juan, I, I was just curious about how uh, isolated are those population from the from the city or from the from the, the neighbors. Do they do they have frequent uh, interactions with uh, the neighboring cities or or, or villages? Well, yeah, they, they are some villages that are far apart, very far away, that they uh, have no interaction. But there are others that there are some people, some members of the village that they can have some interactions, that they go down to sell some products and they come back to the village. So usually okay. that's the way, usually that they can sometimes get new pathogens and take it to the village, especially for the uh, some kind oh. of disease that, that they don't have vaccines, but they get the disease over there and we have outbreaks. So usually some people in the village that are closer to, to the, I mean, the part of the mountain that is closer to the city, they go and they, they exchange products. They come back to the village and that's the way okay. that they can exchange pathogens. We have TB pro also with tuberculosis, a big problem over there, but it's in some families. And it's very strange why uh, most people don't get it, but some families usually, they pass the TB between the members. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting, thank you. Okay, thank you, Juan. Thank you, Nina. Um, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Anybody else wants to speak? I didn't tell you at the beginning, but I can very well tell you now. I'm Sara Savic. I come from Serbia, and I am very happy to be within this network. You can, as you can see, you can travel the world and uh, learn a lot from from other people and other cultures. It is very valuable thing to be in a network like this. So I hope you will promote this network as you go on. Blakely, do we wrap up or you have any more tasks for us? Um, no, I think it's a good time to wrap up. I'll pop, up, I'll pop a couple of links in the chat. So. I think you said that you have put the link in the chat. Okay, he hopefully said that. Okay, so... Thank you for being present at this workshop. There is another workshop coming. Wait a minute. Um, there is another workshop coming on December 13th. So you can you can uh, join that one too. And yes, that's it. I think from us and from Validate. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Juan. That was Really, really, really nice thank presentation. You. It was really great to have. Thanks and to you. Yeah, thank you. And check your calendar invites. Blakely will um, put something in there. And yes, he will do it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Th thank, thank you, Validate, for having us.